What's up, y'all? Uh, I messed up yesterday. Posted the wrong video for the wrong assignment. <laughs> so, I hope you enjoyed a day of getting caught up and making up some of the assignments you were missing. Today I'm posting the right video with the right reading and the right everything. So, get it done. Okay, daily Zoom conference at 11.30 today. As always, uh, shout out to uh, I'm not going to say your name out loud, but you know who you are. You won. I can't put it on YouTube. Won our virtual scavenger hunt yesterday. Yeah, it was a good day yesterday. Okay, so make sure we're getting caught up, getting our work done, getting everything turned in. Yeah. All right. Picking up where we left off on Monday, since Tuesday was messed up. Chapter 14, it is starting with Chase, Chase's perspective. <clears throat> All right, here we go. My dad recently bought himself a souped-up Mustang with 400 horsepower, huge tires, and just enough of a defect in the muffler that it roars like a bulldozer. That's what he drives when he isn't in the Ambrosia electric truck. He won't be caught dead in Corinne's minivan. And, he assures me, when I'm 16, my first lesson will be behind the much-beloved wheel of the stain. I hope not, I tell him, because I won't be able to make out a single word over that engine roar. He laughs appreciatively. You won't be able to hear a police siren either, but you'll be able to outrun one. We pull up in front of my house and he kills the engine so we can hear each other scream. Thanks for dinner, Dad. Corinne's a great cook. The best. Pauline's really fun, too. I guess we're turning into a pretty good friends. He grimaces, because you played princess with her. Yeah, well, we were going to have an ultimate fighting match, but we couldn't find an octagon. Dad doesn't crack a smile. I guess you never struck me as the kind of kid who'd care whether or not he's pretty good friends with a four-year-old. I shrug. She used to be afraid of me. Isn't this better? She wasn't afraid of you, exactly, but you were different then. Tougher. Nobody messed with you. Think of Aaron and Bear. Like that. I'm having flashbacks of my wonderful toughness. Punching and shoving kids, kicking their heels out from under them in the halls, but it's not all bad stuff like that. I remember walking through the school with my shoulders back and my head held high. I remember feeling important and confident and powerful. Maybe some of that came from what a jerk I was, but surely not all of it. I was a star athlete and a state champion. I had a lot of friends. I was somebody in this town. It's not a crime to be proud of that. I reached for the door handle. Anyway, thanks again, Dad. One more thing, Champ, he says quickly. There's this doctor. He's a sports medicine expert, so he has a lot more experience than that quack Cooperman. I talked to his office, and he's willing to take a look at you and give us a second opinion. A second opinion, I echo? We know exactly what happened to me. What's a second opinion going to do? Get you on the field where you belong, he exclaims immediately. Even Cooperman admits you've recovered. It shouldn't cost you your whole season. Dr. Cooperman explained all that, I remind him. You know, abundance of caution and blah, blah, blah. And if it's the right move, Dr. Nguyen will tell you the same thing. <coughs> but if not, you're throwing away your eighth grade year. Maybe another state championship. Nobody's ever won two in a row. Not even me. His, flesh, his face is flushed with passion. There's no doubt in my mind that he's 100% sincere. Even more amazing, he's talking about me surpassing what he accomplished on the Hurricanes. Obviously, there's a lot I can't remember, but for him to suggest I might go beyond him, that he might be the second best after me, that's huge. He could not, how could I not see this Nguyen guy? He's a specialist, which means he knows a lot more about sports injuries than anybody, including Dr. Cooperman. If he gives me the okay to play, then nobody can stop me. I'll tell mom, I promise. God, no, he explodes. When I gawk at him, he adds, we don't have to worry her. She's got enough on her mind. I'll take you to the doctor and win, and when we get the all clear, then we'll find a way to bring it up to your mother. I don't want to get my hopes up too high. You mean, if we get the all clear, I meant. Whatever, but I've got a good feeling about this, champ. You'll have your old life back before you know it. My old life? I allow my mind to sift through the idea. I'm excited to play football, but what I really crave is the chance to be me again. To make up with my best friends and mend fences with the team. Those feelings of self-assuredness and pride won't 
just come from memories anymore. It could all happen very soon. <coughs> Bear snatches the pass out of the air, hugs the ball close to his body, and executes a lightning spin around a lady pushing a baby carriage on the sidewalk. Watch it, she barks as the startled baby begins to scream. Sorry, I shout over my shoulder, and we continue along Portland Street, tossing the ball between the three of us. I'm not back on the team yet, but no one said I couldn't play a friendly game of catch as we make our way to the community service center. The friendly part is just for us. It doesn't include our fellow pedestrians who run for their lives when they see us coming. Hey, cut it out! Watch where you're going! That's my head you almost took off! A ten-year-old kid lets loose a string of obscenities when we knock him off the bike. Kiss your mother with that mouth! Aaron crows gleefully. Laughing, I haul the kid and his bike upright and turn back just in time to see the ball screaming at my face. At the last second, I reach up and pick it out of the air. Not bad, I think to myself. Maybe I really am the star everyone says I used to be. Aaron and Bear are all power and no finesse. Aaron's even kind of a butterfingers. He's constantly running into the road after the bouncing ball amid squealing brakes and honks of outrage. But I seem to have some real skills and what Dad would call good hands. Great catch, Ambrosie, Aaron bellows. Now you see how much the Hurricanes need you. I grin, but don't tell about the but don't tell them about the appointment. Dad's gonna set up with Doctor Nguyen. I don't want them celebrating something that might not happen if the new doctor doesn't clear me to play. But he's going to. I can feel it. When we get to Portland Street residence, I spy Shoshana just stepping in the front door. Luckily, Aaron's looking the other way, and I throw a bear a bullet pass to make sure he doesn't see her. <clears throat> it wouldn't be easy to explain to those guys that she and I are working together. I don't have time to I don't have to sign a timesheet, so when they head to the office I make a beeline for Mr. Solway's room. I'll have to catch up with them at some point, but the way they goof off and eat cookies, I've got plenty of time. I don't feel great about running behind their backs, but it's easier this way. Why stir things up if I don't have to? So the colonel is lecturing us on conserving resources, and right behind him on the landing strip, the PFCs are unloading the six coolers of pastrami sandwiches we had flown in from San Francisco, and we're praying he doesn't turn around because we sent two pilots over 12,000 miles, including a stop at Midway Islands to get us lunch. We're breaking our arms, patting ourselves on the back the way we all, the, patting ourselves on the back that we got away with it. When the colonel sniffs the air and says, Call me crazy, but I could swear I smell pastrami. I cling harder to the flip camera so my laughter won't make the picture jump. <clears throat> I can see that Shoshana, the interviewer, is actually biting the side of her mouth to keep from cracking up. You don't want to do anything to interrupt Mr. Solway. Once he gets started, the stories tumble out, one after another. It's our third day at Portland Street working with the old soldier, and our best yet, Shoshana never planned on spending more than a couple hours here, but neither of us counted on Mr. Solway having so much to say. Most of the time, he's all sarcasm, so it's hard to have a normal conversation with him. The big difference is Shoshana, who's a natural interviewer. She's so genuinely interested that she brings out the best in Mr. Solway. Some of the stories are sad, like losing friends in battle or having to rescue children orphaned by war. Some are uplifting, the works of medics and nurses and the incredible heroism of our ordinary soldiers. But amazingly, in the middle of all the suffering and violence, a lot of funny stuff happened too. Like the pastrami incident, or the time General MacArthur's laundry was sent to their post by mistake, and they used the silk boxer shorts as party hats on New Year's Eve. I get the impression that Mr. Solway was the Army's version of a class clown, which doesn't really match the cranky old geezer he is now. Or maybe it does. I think it was mistrust of authority figures like doctors and administrators. He saw almost as many of those during the war as he does today in the assisted living home. <sighs> After he took out that tank, he spent five weeks in the hospital. He was nearly court-martialed for running an illegal gambling operation. He filled empty IV bags with helium and took bets on balloon races. While he's telling it to Shoshana, he's roaring with laughter. His face is peaked with the joy of memory. I had 50 bucks on the hot water bottle. That was a lot of money in those days, and this crazy Texan threw a hypodermic needle like a dart and brought me down three feet shy of the finish line. I've never been so mad at anybody in my life, but I paid up. At least I was going to until the MPs raided the game, party poopers. 
Engrossed in the story, I nearly missed the twin gasps from the hall. I glanced over my shoulder to spy Aaron and Bear standing in the doorway, standing in bewilderment. Busted. Let's take a break, okay? I set down the camera and joined them outside. Oh my gosh, my neck won't crack. What gives, Bear demands. First, you come with us to community service when you don't even have to. And that's bad enough, but now you're making a movie out of the place? It's for Video Club. And with Shoshana Weber, Aaron cuts me off. Her stupid family got a sentence to the Greybeard Motel. Maybe I've tried to make things right with her, I defend. Maybe if I help her with her project, the family would be more of a forgiving mood. Yeah, that'll work, Aaron snorts. Listen, man, you might not remember how much the Webbers hate our guts, but I do. If it was up to them, we wouldn't be on community service. We'd be on death row. But hey, it's all good. If you want to spend your time with people who curse the day you were born instead of your fr true friends, it's not like we can stop you. I'm torn. On the one hand, I'm not doing anything wrong. Still, I've kind of brought this on myself by covering up the fact that I'm working with Shoshana. Aaron looks honestly hurt, like I'm stabbing him in the back. And let's face it, he might be kind of right. After all, I didn't have to be so secretive about the video project. Bear chimes in. And all the Dumbledores in this place, why do you have to pal around with that one? If you're looking for relics, this place is like an all-you-can-eat buffet. Why him? We're interviewing him, I try to explain. He's the most interesting person here. The guy's a war hero. They stare at me like I've got cabbage for a head, though. A long, weird silence. Finally, Aaron mumbles, yeah, you showed us the picture. The way you ignore all the residents here, I figured maybe you forgot. Yeah, well, we didn't, Bear snaps. We know all about Mr. Steinway. Solway, I correct. Aaron is annoyed. Listen, when you're practicing football three hours a day and doing community service because you have to, not because it's your hobby, you've got a lot more on your mind than remembering every old coot's name. Come on, Bear. Look who's talking about forgetting, Bear adds resentfully as they head down the hall. Way to go, Chase. I chew myself out as they round the corner. This is exactly what I was trying to avoid, and now they're ticked off at me. Worse, they feel like they can't trust me anymore. What next, huh? When I went into the room, the first thing I see is Mr. Solway's walker. Standing against the wall, the old soldier himself is up on his feet, directing Shoshana, who is pulling a heavy box out of the closet. You know, she's saying, Stop being at the army top. People to be more orderly. Mr. Solway throws his head back and guffaws loudly. I'm the exception to that rule. Some of the fellows to this day... They make their bed so tight you could bounce a quarter off a blanket. Me, I always hated to spit and polish. I promised myself that the minute there was no sergeant around to search for a speck of dust on my boots, I was going to be as messy as I wanted to be. Well, in that case, Shoshana informs him, this closet is your crowning glory. Instead of being insulted, the old soldier looks kind of pleased. I can see it from all the way across the room. There are a few shirts, pairs of pants, and one suit on hangers pushed over to one side. The rest of the space, 90% of it, is jam-packed with what can only be described as stuff. Picture the entire contents of a house crammed into a tiny 4x4 space. All the things that would end up in a basement, the garage, the attic, live in the closet. There are books, ping-pong paddles, a broom, a couple of bowling trophies, hip waders, and a fishing rod. Framed pictures, a weed whacker, ice skates. A three-foot-high oriental vase with a crack up the side, a golf umbrella, a garden gnome, luggage, and cartons of varying sizes. As I cross the room, I get a peek inside the box that Shoshana dragged out. It contains three replacement furnace filters, jumper cables for a car, and a sterling silver nutcracker set. It looks exactly like what it is, the things a person collects over 86 years, and when that person moves to a place where the storage is one little closet, it gets pretty tight in there. We've got a lot of great footage, Mr. Solway, talking. Shoshana explains to me from the depths of the collection. But what we need are some visuals to cut away to. Mementos, old photographs, that kind of thing. What do you think? When we're talking project business, she sometimes slips up and treats me like a fellow human. Good idea, I agree. Mr. Solway peers into another box. Son of a gun, I was wondering what I did with my 32-piece ratchet set. I look at him standing up, walking on his own, even bending over to see the inside the carton. It's hard to believe that this is the same Mr. Solway I first met, struggling on the walker and never even bothering to open up the blinds to let some light in the gloomy room. 
Maybe when his wife died and he moved into Portland Street, he lost focus because everything in his life used to revolve around her. But now that Shoshana and I are coming over to work on the video, he's totally different. He wants to present himself well on camera, so he shaves, dresses well, stands straighter, and walks better. According to the nurses, his appetite has improved at mealtimes. We dig around some more moving stuff out of the closet and unpacking boxes until the floor is covered in knickknacks. We do find a few things we can use in the video. Black and white photographs from the barracks in the Korea. The Solway's wedding picture in a double frame with one of their 50th anniversary. His old military dog tags and a set that belonged to a buddy that was killed in war. We've got enough, but Shoshana is like a bloodhound on her hands and knees in the closet, running her hand along the baseboard. What are you doing back there? Mr. Solway asks. Drilling for oil? She reaches behind a golf bag and draws out a navy blue velvet jewelry box of an odd rectangular shape. Embossed in silver on the lid is the great seal of the United States. You found my medal! Mr. Solway exclaims in amazement. Glowing with discovery, Shoshana flips open the cover. The box is empty. Mr. Solway frowns. It must have fallen out. Shoshana and I give the closet floor a thorough inspection. No metal. So, she asks a question. Mr. Solway, when was the last time you wore your metal? In this place? He's sarcastic. Lots of state occasions here. Wheelchair races, canasta games, colonoscopies. What about before that? Before you moved here? He casts out a wry grin. I get you. What if the crazy old codger packed up the empty case for a medal he lost 20 years ago? No, don't apologize. It's a valid question. The answer is I never wore it. Not that I was ashamed of it, but it didn't feel right. Like I'd be saying, look how great I am. I've got a better medal than you. Any dimwit can win a purple heart. My wife used to take it out once a year on Veterans Day, and when I refused to wear it, she'd polish it up and put it away again. Maybe one time she misplaced it. She was confused towards the end. It's possible. He retreats to his easy chair and sits in silence. Talking about his wife makes him sad. We quit filming early in order to leave our subject with his memories. I love Mr. Solway, but he's pretty weird, Shoshana says, as we cross the lobby heading for the exit. He won his country's highest honor and basically ignored it. People were different back then, I offer. You know, more modest. Yeah, sure, modest. But to take so little care that you don't even bother to open the case to see if the metal's still there, and then hide it in the back of your closet behind a golf bag? You've got to be a real oddball. Missing. Oh, we're going through the sliding doors, which might be why she doesn't notice that I stagger for a split second. Missing metal. Empty case buried under tons of junk. Mr. Stolway's medal wasn't lost. It was stolen. Somebody pocketed it and tossed the case where it would be hard to find. Who would do such a thing? There are plenty of possibilities. Portland Street is a busy place with a big staff, doctors, nurses, attendants, service people. There were painters in recently. It could have been one of the other residents or even a visitor. But as I run my mind over the range of suspects at an image, an image keeps forcing itself in front of my eyes. I see a $20 bill in Miss Swanson's shaking hand. I see greedy fingers snatching it away. Bear and Aaron, gloating over the pizza it would buy. <clears throat> of course, there's a big difference between 20 bucks and the decoration awarded to a war hero in the honor of his bravery above, the, above and beyond the call of duty. But somebody greedy enough to take money from a confused old lady who thinks she's tipping room service? How could a guy like that pass up the chance to get his hands on something far more valuable? I turn, my I turn pale because Shoshana regards me in concern. Are you okay? You look like you're about to face plant. I'm fine. I'm so not fine, but I keep my mouth shut. What kind of friend am I that I instantly suspect Aaron and Bear of stealing Mr. Solway's medal? What kind of friends are they that it's so easy for me to believe they did it? Two hard questions followed by a third. What should I do now? Chapter 15 Brendan Espinosa. Of all the video clubs in the middle school, she has to walk into mine. The minute Kimberly Tooley showed up to Miss DeLeo's room, I was lost. Love at first sight. For me, unfortunately, not for her. I mean, she's in love all right with Chase. A few months ago, it would have been easy for me to hate Chase, but he's a different person since the accident, and the more I get to know him, the more I like him. Now, what am I supposed to do? Hate someone I like because of pure jealousy? 
That's just as unfair as when Chase used to pick on me. Maybe more since he truly seems to have no idea that Kimberly likes him. How annoying is that? I'd lie down on railroad tracks for an ounce of her attention, and here's Chase, totally oblivious to the fact that she's practically drooling all over him. Exactly how hard did that kid fall on his head? So I've got Kimberly in my video club, okay? I don't own it, but I am the president. It's a golden opportunity for me to make an impression on her. And who's sucking all the air out of the room? Our rising star, Chase. I've got no one but myself to blame. I recruited him. I raved about his camera skills. <clears throat> when the others wanted to keep him out, I shouted them down. Slowly but surely, they all began to accept and appreciate him. Even Shoshana isn't quite so anti-Chase anymore. Their project on Mr. Solway is coming out fantastic. I've seen some of the footage, and it's going to blow the judges away. Their biggest problem is they're shooting so much great material that it's going to be impossible to figure out what to cut. And that opens an opportunity with Shoshana and Chase wrapped up in their war hero and others focused on the video yearbook. All I have to do is get Kimberly to work with me on a new clip for my YouTube. Then she'll start to see me as the famous YouTuber I'm destined to be. Not the 8th grade nerd she finds so much less interesting than Chase. It's foolproof. No, she says. Why not, I wheedle? It'll be a great chance for you to practice your camera work. Is it for the yearbook? <clears throat> it's way better. It's for YouTube. And your name will be right at the top as co-producer. No, she says again. In total desperation, I blurt, Chase is going to be there. The change is instant. Really? Guess what? She's in. Now all I have to do is convince Chase to sign on with us. Come to think of it, the purpose of this is to turn her off Chase and on to me. I don't think I'm going about it the right way. This whole romance thing is way more complicated than I anticipated. <clears throat> but when I approach Chase, he's not that enthusiastic either. You know I don't have a lot of free time, he tells me. Shoshana and I are really busy with Mr. Solway. I'm pleading now. You've got to help me out. Kimberly begged me to take her along. And you know how lousy she is with a camera. If you don't come, the whole video is going to be upside down. He sighs. All right, Brendan. I'll be there. But now the project is leaving a bad taste in my mouth. Luckily, I have an amazing idea. It's called Thief Man. I know that Kimberly sees me starring in this. She'll be impressed. It could very well be the video that finally takes me viral. We, went, we meet in the park the next day after school. I've got everything we need. A morph suit, rollerblades, and 11 bottles of pancake syrup. I hand Kimberly camera one and chase camera two. Although I'm pretty sure Chase's footage will be the real video, anything usable Kimberly shoots will be a happy accident. I duck behind a tree and take out the morph suit. To my dismay, it's white. I specifically told my mom to get black. I'm going to look like a bowling pin in front of Kimberly, but it's too late to fix that now. I put on the suit and the rollerblades and glide back to Chase and Kimberly. All right, you guys, dump the syrup all over me. If the goal is to get Kimberly to notice me, Mission accomplished. Why, she asks wide-eyed. I point to the far end of the park to the giant mountain of leaves the gardeners have blown in the corner. I cover myself in sticky syrup and roller blade down the hill into the leaves. When I come out, it's Leaf Man. I'm Leaf Man. All the leaves are going to be stuck to the syrup, see? And the video will be called Leaf Man. So, Chase takes pity on me. It's going to be awesome. He opens one of the bottles and pours a thick stream over my head. Even though the morph suit fabric, it feels gooey and gross. The things I do for my art, and Kimberly of course, although that doesn't seem to be working too well. 11 bottles later, later I'm covered in the stuff and starting to draw flies. Alright, I say, let's do this. Confession, I'm not the greatest rollerblader in the world, and I can't get up the hill. I keep rolling back further than I make it forward. They have to haul me up to the top, Kimberly dragging me by my wrists and Chase pushing me from behind. We get some strange looks, although nowhere near the number we're bound to attract when we shoot the actual video. Production is put on hold for a few minutes while my camera people wash the stickiness off their hands and get into position by the leaf pile. At least Chase, at last, Chase flashes me the high sign and I ease the weight off my foot brake and sense the slope starting to move me slowly forward. The slowly part doesn't last very long. The acceleration happens much faster than I expected. In a few seconds, I'm hurtling down the path at dizzying speed. 
Proper rollerblade form says I should crouch for better balance, but I'm too scared to bend my locked knees. I can actually feel the G-forces forming around the syrup on my face, and the syrup is going into thin streams. With a sinking heart, I realize that this video may go even more viral than I thought. Not as Leaf Ma Man, but as Kid breaks every bone and body in goo-drenched rollerblading stunt. Through a brownish film of syrup, I spot Kimberly and Chase on either side of the mountain of leaves. Flip Cam's pointed at me. At least, Chase's is pointed at me. Kimberly seems to be filming the air above my head. Then, they're gone, and all I can see is the leaf pile barreling toward me. I hit the leaves, and foof! And end up buried at least four feet inside the mountain before my momentum stops. I lie there for a moment, stunned, listening to the muffled sound of Chase laughing from the outside world. It takes a long time to fight my way out of the mess because a lot of the mess is coming up with me, stuffed by the syrup to the morph suit. When I ripped leaves off my face, I can see that the pile is about a third, a third as big as it was, and the sky is dancing with bellowing debris. As soon as I catch breath, I finish the script by thrusting my fist in the air and bellowing, Leaf Man! I never quite get the second syllable out because I'm bowed over by a golden retriever who climbs on top of me. Licking the syrup. I can already hear the chorus of barking, and I know that every dog in the park is heading in my direction. At least they'll be keeping the flies at bay. I struggle up and try to skate away, but the wheels on my blades are jammed with syrup soaked leaves. I take three clumsy steps forward before landing flat on my face, where I'm immediately buried under a canine swarm. I'm gratified to see that Chase is still filming, his hands steady, even though he's doubled over in hilarity. I don't get it, Kimberly says over the dog surfing. Is this supposed to be funny? This, the amazing thing is that after all this, I still like Kimberly just as much as before. Maybe even more. Love isn't just blind. It's also totally stupid. Alright, y'all. That's where we're going to stop for today. Make sure you guys are answering those questions on Classroom. Um... We need to make sure we're staying up to date with all of our assignments. Um, yeah, we're a little bit more than halfway through the book. So as we continue this journey of online learning, make sure we're keeping up with it. We're going to start Fish in a Tree after this book. So we'll have another book to go through together. Um, yeah, until then, get your assignments done. Check social studies. Check math and science. Check art and music if you're in those classes, and make sure you're keeping up with your BCO assignments, okay? All right, I'll see you all tomorrow.